Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. So basically, when it comes to these type of problems, as you'll see in the lab, assignments, exams, whatever, is you're going to have two different scenarios. You're going to have the first scenario, which is basically just a bunch of nice easy shapes kind of combined together. And if that's the case, you use the formulas on the previous slide. But then the second case is where they give you kind of a weird shape. And if that shape is defined by a function, well, that means you're going to be using calculus, which is very unfortunate. Again, from what I've seen, engineering students usually get up and run away as soon as you mention the word calculus. So what we can do is we can treat physical bodies as a collection of particles or atoms that are packed tightly together. Problem is, is if we were to analyze each atom in a body and do that summation formula, well, we'd be here forever. We're basically not accomplishing anything. However, if our body is considered to be continuous, we can actually do some very special things. Because if our body is continuous, we can replace that summation in our formula with an integral. So basically, I'm going y bar, which is the summation of wi, y squiggle i, etc. Well, I can replace this with y bar is equal to the integral of y squiggle dw divided by the integral dw, where y squiggle is the center y location of the elements in our body. And then the second one, dw, is the weight of the elements within the body. So if you're looking at this, you're saying, okay, well, it's all right. Like, it's not too complex, but we actually have one problem. It is very difficult to differentiate something with respect to weight. So we're only going to make one modification to this formula, and that is this. We are going to split that weight term into two separate terms, specific weight and volume. Now, what is specific weight? It's simply going to be the total weight of our body divided by the total volume of our body. If this was the case, we can actually say that our differential weight term dw is equal to gamma, our specific weight, times dv. And if we were to substitute that into our formula, we get the following formula. So it's almost identical. The only difference now is we have that specific weight term at the top and bottom. And instead of differentiating with respect to weight, we're actually differentiating with respect to volume, which is a lot more simple. Uh, <laughs> a little spoiler alert for you guys that are going into second year. Math, uh, I don't know what it is. Calculus 3, basically. All you're doing is differentiating with respect to volumes. So this is something you will come to love and enjoy well, let's be honest, something you'll come to hate and despise <laughs> later on in your second year. It's typically what we do, though. We always want to differentiate with respect to volume. Now, it looks really bad, but trust me, it's going to be easy. I'm going to show you guys a quick example, and you guys are going to be laughing. Well, at least I hope so. You guys are probably laughing at how bad this video is. <laughs> uh, not my fault. All right, so if we were to repeat this process for x bar and y bar, we kind of have the same thing that we had before, where all the formulas are the same. The only difference is if I'm doing x bar, it's x squiggle. If I'm doing y bar, it's y squiggle, etc. So again, gamma here is the specific weight of an element, which is the total weight over the total volume. dv is the volume of an element in our body. And x squiggle, y squiggle, and z squiggle is the center location of an element in our body. The key here, which I underlined three times, is an element. An element. We're not considering the body as a whole, we're looking at a little slice or a little element. Now this is great for us because you guys look at this and say, well, the problem we had with the other formulas was y squiggle, etc. We don't know where that is for a weird shape. Remember for a rectangle, y squiggle is just kind of halfway up. But if we have a weird ass shape, who knows where it is? And I told you guys, and you trusted me, you said, or at least I said, well, we are going to avoid this problem using integration. But if we look at the formulas, y squiggle is still there. Why is y squiggle still there? I don't know where y squiggle is for weird shapes. Well, again, the key here is now we're not looking at the shape as a whole. We're looking at an element in that shape. And if you guys remember from calculus with integration, what we're basically doing is we're creating a bunch of rectangles under the curve. The key here, rectangles. Remember that rectangles, we know where y squiggle is. It's going to be halfway up. So if we were to take a curve and replace it with a bunch of rectangles, we know the y squiggle for each one of those rectangles. Now, you guys are still saying, Clayton, <laughs> you lost me four slides ago. I have no idea what's going on. Let me show you an example. Let me, let me guide you through calculus. 
Calculus is not my strong suit, I'm gonna make that clear, but hopefully I'm able to help. Let's say that we have our good old triangle. Now again, we already know what a triangle is. We dealt with it so many times when it came to distributed loads. So you guys are saying, ah, I already know it's going to be B over three. Let's see if we can prove it. So we have a triangle here. It starts at H and it goes down linearly to point B. We are going to say that the specific gravity is 50 and the thickness of this triangle into the page, because remember, if we look at the formulas, we're dealing with volumes, not areas. The thickness into the page is going to be equal to one. And the question is, what is going to be this X bar or this X component of our center of gravity? Again, we already know intuitively, since our mass is the same everywhere, it's going to be equal to B over three. But let's see if we can prove it. So if we were to look here, the first question is, okay, what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for X bar. And if I look above, I have a nice sexy formula for X bar. But in its current state, it means nothing. I love watching students look at this formula and then look at the shape and then look at the formula and then you can just see things breaking inside their head. Like, how do I get these components from this shape? <laughs> Again, it's actually pretty simple. The first one we are going to look at is going to be this DV term, a differential volume term. Again, it looks really complex, but it's actually going to be simple because what we're going to do is we are going to take a little element of that shape. So the element is going to be rectangular. Again, if you remember integration, all we're doing is taking a bunch of rectangles underneath our curve. So I'm going to take a little blue element here and I'm going to expand it over into the side. And basically all I'm going to do is try and find the volume of this element, the volume, that's it. So if we took a vertical slice, we know that in the X direction, we want the tiny, teeny, tiny little vertical slice. So this component right here is going to be dx, an infinitesimal little distance. Where it starts to get complex is, okay, what is the height of this square? Well, we know that the height is going to be equal to y. And since I know that y is a linear function, we know it's going to follow mx plus b. So if I were to substitute mx plus b, we know that the height of this element is going to be negative h over bx plus h. Again, it's just the equation defining the line. So I say, okay, I now know the width of this rectangle. I know the height of the rectangle and I know the depth of this rectangle. So if I want to, I can find the differential volume as just base times height times width or whatever <laughs> I said before, basically one, because it's one unit into the page, that negative H over BX plus H, that is the height. And then that DX term at the very end, that is the width. So all I did was, again, I found a little rectangle and I found the volume of it. That was it, nice and simple. So now we have an expression for our DV term. The last thing that we want is going to be, okay, what is this X squiggle? Remember, X squiggle is the distance from the plane to the centroid of our shape. And for these little rectangles, our centroid is kind of right at the center. So if we were to look here uh, on our figure to the left, we know that X squiggle is going to be this distance right here. And this is actually just going to be equal to X because again, our slice can be anywhere along this shape. That's why the HX term or the height of that slice is varied along X. And we know that the distance from the plane is also going to vary with X. So it's just going to be equal to X in this case, nice and simple. If I wanted Y squiggle, I know it's not really asked. I'm going to put my mouse on the screen here. If I wanted Y squiggle, well, we know it's going to be halfway up our slice. So it would be y, which is the complete distance, divided by two. So that's it. That's why integration is actually nice because when we look at our element, the rectangles. And for rectangles, we know what y squiggle, x squiggle, and even z squiggle are. So if I were to take x squiggle as well as my dv term and substitute it into our equation, we get the following integral. So notice at the very end, it's dx. We're integrating over the x-axis so my bounds in the integral, which I'll bring my mouse back and highlight again, are going to be from zero to B, because again, we're integrating over this X axis right here. So if you guys were to say, okay, I now know everything I need to know, and you were to do the integrals, you're going to get the following, which simplifies to B over three. And that's it. That's how you prove it. It's actually pretty nice. Now you guys are looking at this saying, Clayton, I don't want to do integration. 
I don't blame you. I don't either. Do you think that I did this by hand? <laughs> I threw that baby right into the computer as fast as I humanly could. And I suggest you guys do the same. So that's going to be center of gravity. Again, two cases. We have discrete bodies, which are a collection of simple shapes. And then we have the calculus ones, where basically shapes are defined by functions. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.